All right, so thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I have uh, uh, been asked by Rico to be concise. So <laughs> that is the end of my talk. <laughs> <laughs> Leave every hope to you, Hunter, in case you don't speak Italian. So that's the, these are the gates of hell. As, uh, you go and build your startup, uh, that's, uh, that's basically your destiny. No, I'm joking. So I have a real presentation. And uh, uh, what this presentation is about and what this is not about, right? So I'm gonna talk about a few things. I don't have a ton of time. This will deserve more time. But this is not a comprehensive list of all the errors that you might do as, a, as an entrepreneur. It's just a partial view of some of the issues that we might face and uh, what we did to, to, uh, to overcome these issues. So you cannot avoid all the errors. Um, this may be will help you to avoid the terminal errors, the errors that kill you. And uh, it's not a recipe for, for a unicorn, right? So, you know, I, uh, although Rico say successful and preserved, you know, we did okay, and we're still uh, doing okay, we're alive, but, you know, we, did, we are not a $75 billion company. So, okay. so I will follow uh, roughly a chronological order, so I will tell you a little bit of the story, and along the lines, you see this uh, post-it. So these are important things. If you if you doze off, you fall asleep, uh, you know, just wake up for this one, it's very important, all right? So the, the company started as a passion, and I think uh, many of you uh, out here are in this situation. So, you know, you have a passion, you're, you're a kid playing with math or whatever field you're playing with, and uh, at a certain point, this becomes uh, a thing. And for us, the thing was this. So we, I actually joined psychology back in, uh, in Trieste, and uh, there was no artificial intelligence program, so I started to to, to think how, how do I understand psychology more uh, by building you know, the brain and say, oh, okay, well, nobody knew how to do it, so I you know, started to do it by myself, reading, programming, etc. and then I went to Boston eventually. But uh, that's what we did. So we, we started the brain and we created a computational model that emulates these processes in, in, uh, in math, and then from that, I'm not a mathematician, I'm the furthest from a mathematician you, you can think of. Uh, but, you know, I had to learn the necessary tools, you translate it in math, once it's in math it's a computation, once it's a computation it's a computer program, and all of a sudden you have an artificial brain that can do stuff, right? If you're emulating perception, navigation, or other skills, then you have these artificial skills that, uh, that do stuff. And these are the co-founders, that's my wife uh, as well, so... <laughs> uh, so she spent years uh, studying vowels, no, not really, but she, she studied speech, uh, speech production and speech perception. And this is Anatoly, he's from Mother Russia, so he um, spent most of his uh, uh, PhD time uh, emulating rat's brain uh, in software. And then it's me, I never <laughs> did, uh, uh, you know, fashion stuff, uh, we are part of, you know, cousin, etc., but I always did neural modeling, not this kind of modeling. Mm -hmm. And my field was the, the studies of the cerebral cortex, how it processes information, how it learns, and, uh, and, uh, and its dynamics. And, and while doing the PhD, we had a huge problem. And the, the problem is that these models were really massive. So this is a, a caricature of a neuron. So it's as, as small as a, as a simulation you can do. There's a cell body, these are the, you know, that's the axon and the, the dendrites. And uh, in order to simulate just the neuron, it's a bunch of differential equations that you have to integrate in parallel. And so when you simulate billions of them, you can imagine you press, you know, you press your simulation, you go, you go for, for a run in Boston, you come back after an hour. You know, time went really slowly. And so what we did, and I was talking about this just before the, the, um, the beginning of the talk, um, we, we looked at the uh, way to accelerate our PhD and, uh, and our programs. And so we went to NVIDIA. I'm sure you heard the, the name of the company recently. And we told them, that's about 2004, and we told them, listen, can you use your GPUs to accelerate uh, this neural network, right? And the idea was very simple. Each pixel was a neuron, and then you can simulate everything. 2004, right? And NVIDIA told us, <laughs> who cares? Who cares about neural networks? Who cares? So as opposed to, to go to, to that place, we went to AMD. And the AMD was like, okay. So they gave us access to the metal. And so writing assembly code, my, my Russian friend, uh, we were able to build uh, the first neural network running on the GPU. And so we, we patented it, and uh, we got like 10, 10 to 100 times speed up. And uh, you know, we got this patent, and then um, we sit on it, right? And so at a certain point, one day I went to the bathroom, 
and uh, Abbas University, and I met Madhu. Madhu was doing the PhD with me, and uh, he told me, hey, you seem an inquisitive guy. Why don't you go and take a business class uh, at Boston University? It was free, so we did. We took a business class. And that's where we, important, that's where we, we first had our first encounter with the Office of Technology Transfer. Do you have the music? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the Office of Technology Transfer can be a very uh, mild, uh, you know, office, or it can be run by Count Dracula, right? And uh, we had the Count Dracula at Boston University. So the first thing that they told us, we went there and said, we have this idea, you know, want to use GPU for artificial intelligence. And they say, yeah, huh, sign here. And so there were three students that said, who are we signing? So we were basically assigning all our intellectual property to the university. And they said, no, we're not going to sign this. We're gonna look at it later, right? So, brace for the worst, hope for the best, right? In our case, we did okay, but it could have been a disaster. We could have assigned our discovery, which we did outside of our PhD program, really. It was like a side thing. We could have assigned to Boston University, and that could have been you know, a disaster for our, for our start, right? So, how entangled is your technology with the university? Are there good programs we were talking about last night at dinner that enable you to get that that uh, with, with a certain amount of certainty, low risk, low cost, etc. So that's a very important phase in your life. That was the experiment I was telling how we did a business class back in, uh, in uh, and the, the assignment of this business class was to create a business <coughs> plan. And so we thought AI is going to be at the center of all of this, right? AI neural network. Biotech, healthcare, defense, academics, information security, finance. That's an undershot, right? Today is much more than that. But that was our business plan. But 2006, and I use this generative AI to build this, of course, sorry. It was, it was the dark ages of AI, right? So I, I remember submitting grants to, to the Air Force, and, uh, I, and the guy told me, yeah, I like your proposal. You, you, seem, you seem like a, a nice guy, but can you take away this neural network thing from it? Because it, it is stupid. Nobody believes that, that it works, right? So we, we did, we took it away. We say algorithms. Uh, but it was really, really um, a, a bad time to, to start the company around neural networks. So that's the business plan we thought we were going to sell basically GPUs augmented uh, with a little FPGA that would enable those GPUs to get pro programmable. Because back then, I called that era before CUDA or BC, um, before, before uh, Christ, um, it was not possible to program the GPU as we do today, very simply. And uh, so we did this pattern. And what do we do with it, right? Note, patents, right? So many of you write, uh, I think, algorithms, right? So you are computational people. And so the, the question is, do I, um, do I go and patent my, my discovery, right? So there is a difference between hardware, which is more you know, simple, it's a little simpler and more straightforward to write a patent about it than, than software. We did, we wrote a bunch of patents. And, uh, and then the question is that you have to ask yourself uh, is how, how you're gonna use it, right? Once you have it, you, you're going to enforce it, right? Do you have the money? Are you planning to have the money to, to enforce it? Are you planning to sell? What is the value attached to the buyer of the, of, of the company to the patents? And this varies a lot. We have had companies who came and knocked on our door who say, your patents are really interesting, and others they say, I couldn't care less, right? So patent, patents are expensive, at least in, Europe, in the in US. They cost a lot of money. Defending is 10 to 100x more expensive. And so it's something that you need to, to, to ask yourself if, if it's worth or not. So in 2006, we started uh, incorporation. We did it after dinner. It was like you know, the computer, 20 minutes, half an hour. It took me six months to start uh, uh, the subsidiary in Italy, the SRL. Uh, so, moment of silence here. Uh, so we started the company here at Boston University, you know, in front of MIT, Harvard, and there. And so the company had three people, right? And so the three people, and that's also important to think about how you, you build up your team. We had kind of three, three main uh, factors, you know, if you, if you do factorial analysis. I was the why. Uh, all of us had PhD, we were professors in AI, so very similar, right? But we had some slight differences. This, you know, I was the why. We need to do this because it's going to be huge. You know, I look at the future. Uh, Anatoly is, is more of the what. Okay, now that you have your, this crazy vision, let me tell you exactly what we're going to do. 
and header is the how, right? So we were hopeless without somebody who can sequence our thoughts and our actions in time to make this you know, happen rather than, uh, than staying in the game. And so back in 2006-ish, that, that was our first project. This is Boston University, at Tech Alley. I think there's a sound here. But you couldn't hear it. So we, we put an AI system to detect uh, uh, gunshots. So this robot was then deployed in Afghanistan to help the soldier you know, uh, figure out the azimuth elevation of a, of a sound. So we would classify the sound, distinguish if, if it was a bird, a balloon popping, or, or a Kalashnikov. And then it will basically orient and say that's where it comes from. That was our first project. But back then, the situation was still iffy for AI. Uh, and I usually say that for AI to become reality, there are three main ingredients. Uh, of course, you need the mind or the algorithm, but you also need the brain, you know, the NVIDIA or the computational power, and you need the body, places to put this. And you know, robots were really expensive, cars were not equipped to be self-driving back then, and uh, algorithms were still uh, in need of work, and brains, again, you know, there was not much mobile GPUs uh, uh, available, so no, it wasn't the right time to start. And that's another thing to notice. Is it the good time for you? And uh, if you are if you're, uh, into something big, chances are that people will tell you you're crazy. Like, as it happens to us, you know, they told us, who cares? Like, if you hear who cares, you're probably onto something either really stupid or really, really good. <laughs> uh, and so if it's really good, you have to ask yourself, is this the time to, to actually jump ship? Um, timing is everything, right? So in our case, um, what, we, uh, what we thought was the gating function was the hardware availability, which is, is the hardware fast enough, and we're thinking about robotics as the first application, is that fast, fast enough to enable real-time interaction of the robot, you know, because I need to see where I'm going before I trip again on the, you know, on, on the cable. And, and so do I have to have a frame rate for my AI algorithm that is fast enough to support this intelligence, right? And uh, what's your crossing point? You know, you, you must ask yourself, uh, when am I ready to jump? So we didn't. At a certain point, we stayed at the university. We started to work on a, a big project called the DARPA Synapse, which was the, uh, the beginning of neuromorphic processors. Uh, and so that it was a two-partite program. In the, we, we lived here. We were doing the algorithms and the brain part. And other companies, IBM, Hewlett Packard, and the HRL, were building the hardware based on this little thing called uh, nano, nano, nano junction, a crossbar junction uh, based on this very tiny atom-wise um, devices made of uh, uh, titanium dioxide that would basically emulate the synapses at the very low power. So this will be able to scale the brain roughly with the power of the human brain, which was 60 watts. It didn't work because it was impossible, right? But um, it, it spun off an industry, right? So the low power computation alternative to GPU kind of got the roots in, uh, in this program. And so this is Versace number one. This is Gabriel. Uh, so at that time, we were still at the university. He's about to destroy the, the ear of the robot. So life goes on while you go all, all these startups, you know. You get married, maybe, you have kids. So remember that you have to do that too, <laughs> right? And so at that point, uh, we got a breakthrough, right? So we started to write, uh, we got a cover page on the IEEE spectrum, which was like, for us, was the biggest bang, right? So people started to notice us, and then other cover pages with uh, Europe Packard, et cetera. So we got some notoriety. And thanks to that, we got NASA, right? As a company, they came to us and said, your stuff is interesting. Can you put <coughs> these artificial brains or robots, because we can't control these robots from space, it takes too much time to control uh, a Mars rover from, uh, from Earth, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, no. So we started to work with NASA on uh, uh, shrinking these brains down to a mobile GPU to be able to control the robot in real time. And the idea is that each robot should have his own brain, it shouldn't borrow the brain of, uh, of uh, you know, the controller. And so we, we eventually, we spun off the company. So this is in 2013, we entered the Techstar program, and that was our first office with a few of the initial employees, and, you know, not, not, none of these uh, came to, the, you know, to, to today's company, but this is Heather and this is Anatoly, and we are still together. And so we entered this accelerator when she was two weeks old. This is Francesca, she's number two, and uh, my wife used to feed her during the, the, the textile program, which was interesting. But, um, so, and uh, that's, that's the key. At that point, we decided enough. We were done with the university. The, um, you know, the, 
we jumped, we, we took the leap. And that's something that uh, is probably one of the most crucial part of your life. If you're still in that hybrid phase, we were hybrid for a long time, right? So we were at the university, DARPA, grants, etc. There was a lot of uh, an incestual relationship between our company and the university for a while because we were mixing you know, activities, etc. right? So there might be exception, but you have to take a choice most of the time, right? Uh, time is what it is. So you don't have time for two lives at the same time. Most VCs won't fund you, right? Many VCs will say, ah, give me a call back when you're serious. And the message is, you know, you might have some full-time employees, but what is the message that you're sending them if you're not, if you're like 20% on the company? And we were at a certain point, 50% on the company and the other employees were like, mm, you know, are you serious, right? So it's a bad, it's a bad thing. So you have to jump at a certain point uh, when the time is right. Another thing that is going to happen at this very phase is that you're going to start the company. And uh, chances are that there are multiple co-founders, right? And so how do you s split the shares? Like, okay, well, in this platonic universe, everybody gets the same shares, which we did. And as soon as we got funded, they say, uh-uh, that's not a good idea. Some of, some of you will be the CEO, he needs more, some of you will, you know, needs less. And so this asymmetry, they broke the symmetry right away. And uh, there are pros and cons to, to both approaches, right? And uh, equal sounds really good, but remember the old Finnish tale, my PP of engineering is Finnish. Uh, when you are in the frozen tundra and you pee your pants, you might feel warm <laughs> and, and fuzzy for the first minute, but then you realize it's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> so this is us at the at the accelerator, and uh, you know started to work. Who were we selling, right? Back then, AI, you know, at the very beginning. So we thought we were going to shrink our brain robots, uh, uh, brains for robots, into a cell phone to control robots. But then there weren't the many robots available back then. Most of them were drones, so this is one of my employees that train a drone with a brain controlled by the cell phone and is trying to escape before the drone murders him. And uh, this is another uh, little toy robot uh, built by Parrot that is, you know, learn this car and follows it around. And we thought, okay, that might be cute. So let's do that. And so we started to work on these mobile devices. That's a drone flying, flying around. Uh, then we started also in 2012-ish to work with self-driving cars and the uh, uh, enterprise drones that to do inspections of uh, you know, power lines, etc. So that was all fun, and we thought we were going to sell you know, an SDK, brains for both SDK, for all of these smart devices, from cars to, to drones, etc. Then we started doing one thing that you should do way before we did, which is talking to a customer. All right? Let's get out of the imagination and talk to a customer. Right? Do this as soon as possible. A big mistake, companies that you know stay in their own R&D head and then they never talk to customer. Uh, do it as soon as you can, right? Because as soon as we, we did, we got a bunch of information counterintuitive with respect to what we thought. So, but we built enough uh, stuff that we got noticed. Uh, we got our first uh, investment. I think we raised about uh, 14 million at this point. It's 2016, end of 2016. So we got all this money, we said, wow, fantastic, what do we do with it, right? And uh, be careful, right? So, note, this deserves a separate presentation, but be really careful who you choose as a VC. And I don't know what I've written here, uh, but the thing that you should do is you should do your due diligence to the investor, right? Uh, no, don't have them only do due diligence on you, but figure out what they do, who they are. And the thing that I did is uh, I, I spoke with companies that they, they did uh, a good job, right? So they, they, I, I asked the VC, introduce me a few companies. But in, say, okay, but say, wait a second. Don't introduce me just the, the, the best company. I want to talk to a company where things didn't go well. Because that shows the real character of the investor. Or everybody, or all the people, right, that are around you. What happens when the shit hits the fan, right? When, when uh, things get tough. And so I ended up selecting the investor that uh, gave uh, the best support to, to the companies when the company was in trouble. And uh, remember to ask me what happened with my first term sheet. My first term sheet from, was from Milan, from a firm in Milan that uh, we, we, you know, we were negotiating. And then they went silent. Um, and then I figured out a month later that they all went to jail. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Yeah, I mean, we almost got money from a, a firm that went to jail, so we didn't do a very good job in the due diligence. We dodged the bullet, right? We were lucky, but try to do diligence to your investor as well. So each one of you has two souls inside, most likely. One that wants to do <coughs> cool stuff, and the other one, smaller, who wants to do money, right? And uh, this is Versace point three, this is Aria, who tells us, hey guys, just make money, stop doing uh, you know, experiments and uh, produce some stuff, right? And so that's, that's what we did. Finally, you know, after, uh, you know, AI also was maturing a bit, that the market was maturing. We ended up deploying our solution about uh, I don't know, 60 million devices, ranging from cell phones, drones, um, robots. This is a kind of a creepy robot in the grocery store, in a 500 grocery store in the United States. The majority of our deployment were in, uh, in cell phones, though, right? So AI uh, applied to photography uh, in you know, commercial devices. Well, that was great, so we were able to take our stuff and put it into some sort of uh, application, <coughs> but how do we scale, right? And so that's a, another big question that you guys are going to face uh, really soon, which is, uh, are you a service company or are you a product company, right? And uh, at the beginning, you kind of need to be both, uh, but eventually VCs don't like too much service companies, although there are exceptions, uh, they like product companies, right? Uh, services are cozy, they're necessary, they're, they're you know, a stepping stone, uh, but the, the thing that I suggest to you is to build an MVP as soon as possible. Like, don't be ashamed of how stupid it might look like or how limited, but the sooner you get to an MVP, a minimal viable product, the better for you. And so our idea to prioritize was to fundamentally decrease the chokehold between all the various applications that you can build in AI and uh, the one that we're built. So we're here in about 2018-19. Uh, it wasn't still easy to build and deploy AI application, and so we thought our technology built into a platform, our technology learns really, really fast. Um, and uh, I won't go into the details of the AI, uh, but we, we say, okay, well, we can solve a ton of problems if we create the sort of uh, WordPress for brains. WordPress was the first kind of tool that enabled anybody to build a website from scratch, right? And so the idea, can anybody with zero expertise in Web, web design in this case, or in AI in our case, build and deploy AI applications. And so that's, that's what we did. We launched this uh, Brain Builder product uh, when uh, uh, Leonardo was born, Versace 4.0. And uh, the idea is that you can just take any you know, e video or images and build uh, a visual AI application in minutes, right? It was very, very fast, very easy to use. Uh, and we thought that uh, our idea would be to deploy uh, and, you know, these visual uh, uh, algorithms mostly in the domains that we were operating. But you see here also something new, industrial machines uh, besides smart devices, drones, or robots. And uh, the, the question here that we asked ourselves and that you eventually you will ask yourself is who are you facing? So who are you facing? In, in our case, we were basically going to uh, large-scale uh, auto machine learning application so that the company that we started to face were Google, Microsoft, Amazon, etc., etc., which were giving out the, pro the product that we had for free, right? Because they can afford it, so they, they will squash you eventually. So think of that, think of the market you're going to be operating eventually because you're going to face those juggernauts eventually down the road. And so we verticalize. We, we say, okay, well, let's build something where they can go unless they verticalize themselves. And so we specialize this auto machine vision for a, a, a very particular but still huge task for vision inspection, which is very similar to what we were doing with drones, but it just had to do with um, you know, machines or production floor. And uh, we verticalize uh, the product as, as two events occurred. First was the ban of, uh, you know, the beginning of the trade war between US and China, so we lost our biggest customer, which was 80% of our sales. Nice, right? And COVID, so it was a, a double punch, one in the guts and one in the face. And uh, that's when we launched our product. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, without the ability to go into factory because everything was closed. So very tough time, very difficult, but eventually, you know, we are still alive, we survived, and now things are much better. Another thing to think of is, if you're building something that is really crucial, that is really you know crazy, then and we didn't, we never thought of it. But uh, we had to face geopolitical issues. This is the third time in our short history that we that we are basically dealing with presidents 
uh, of the United States uh, bans or change of direction or consequences. So we, we thought we wanted AI to be the most important things when nobody cared, but we have to be careful what you wish for, because now is the most important thing and everybody cares, and, and so you have to navigate very, very, very carefully the, the environment. And we're outside of our control. Which brings us to today, I don't have time to go into details, but we are alive, we are doing well. And uh, the things that we learn very quickly, you start with an idea and then you zoom in. Uh, so don't be afraid of cutting, cutting, cutting and going to the, to the core. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint, so be prepared to suffer. Uh, go back to the first slide. Uh, and uh, yeah, if you can make it in Italy, you can make it everywhere. We're talking about how difficult it is to make startups here. Uh, you guys are going to have muscles and uh, you know, you're going to be trained to go through everything. So I stop here. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah. Thank you, Max. Uh, we are ahead of schedule. Max was really super fast and concise. So we have plenty of room for Q&A. So any curiosity, as you can see, you know, it's very intriguing. Very interesting, very interesting story. Uh, thank you for the very, very nice presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, I have a general question about the startups. Usually when you want to start something, um, your expertise are not enough, and you cannot find everyone to be your co-founder. Okay? Mm. So you're going to need some talent, which doesn't come cheap, especially in the kind of tech companies, OK? Mm. So how, how do you provide the seed money? For your project, you started with your co-founders. Yep. So, and usually the VCs are not interested in the seed, um, seed money or something like that. And also, if you get the seed money, you, you're going to give almost everything. So uh, what is your suggestion for starting a product yep. which cannot be as novel as you presented here? Because uh, it's something, as you said, very, very good or very, very bad. So usually. Uh, guys like me try to start something in the middle, okay? Mm. Not too bad, not too good. Okay, so, so yeah, it's a it's a question which has many components, right? So the first question, that the counter question, is who are you looking for in terms of founder? And so we, as you as you saw, we're all AI people, and it, it's very hard to actually make it if you have uh, uh, just one kind of expertise. If you are all AI people, then you kind of feed on your own ideas and you need diversity, right? And so we really reach that diversity as we join the Techstar Accelerator program, which is, I think part of the, you know, the, the work that Enrico does is to provide these sort of mentorships where you have collision of different skill set. So for instance, as part, as part of the Accelerator program, we were exposed to salespeople, marketing people, uh, strategy, uh, software engineering, which we didn't really have much you know, the, on the, on the you know, kind of product side. Uh, UX, uh, UI expert, all of those, and so it, it, it kind of you have to you have to navigate back from the goal, which is what does your company looks like at uh, the steady state, uh, and then navigate back who are the talents that you need. So chances are that as a scientist you need uh, business people, you need marketing people, you need business people very importantly to figure out who you're going to sell to, right? So that's one part of the answer. The other part is uh, where to find money. So the best thing to do is not to need any money, but you know, obviously if you're building a hardware startup, that's impossible, right? So you, have, you need uh, some seed money. And in the in United States, and I don't know how widespread it is in Italy, there, there is a, a, a band of investors called angels, right? Oh, with the wings, uh, right? And so, so those are the guys who provide the first capital uh, besides Accelerator, because Accelerator, like Techstars, provides a little bit injection of cash. In our case, it was, I think, $120,000, which was not too much, but, you know, because it has cost more, but was sufficient to get a little boost. So Accelerators can provide some cash. Uh, angels can provide cash before you go to the VC, which can provide also seed money. Uh, and then there is all the, all the range, right, from Series A to Series B. Uh, a few firms do all the all the seeds, but uh, all, all the stages. But others specialize in Series A because they want to get 20% and blah blah blah. 
and others are more prone to the scaling of the company. So there is, you know, I, and I, I assume in Italy similar, but less big and, uh, and, and mature. Uh, and you know, another thing that you, you might consider is, is actually moving the startup to to, to to United States, where all this stuff are there are there for you, so you don't have to to spend 20 minutes on the phone to get your pack to work. Uh, if I can add something, you know, the first thing you have to do beside developing your your product, okay, is understanding if it really solves a problem of someone. Okay, because developing software or code or whatever or hardware with no problem, meaningful problem, this is the reason why Max said talk to customers as soon as you can. Because customers will, uh, will help you understanding which are the good reasons for not to buy your product. Okay, so if you have to do something which is counterintuitive, you don't validate, you have to invalidate, find all the roadblocks the good reason people will have not to buy your product, okay? Once you've done the job, you have a good grasp about the fact that the market exists for what you're able to do. At that point, you can have conversation with, with the investors because what they look at is the opportunity for your company. And of course, you have to be capable of doing what you're promising. But I assume that if you're promising someone that you will develop an algorithm, a code or something, whatever you're gonna develop, you are not telling lies. You're not bullshitting, okay? So I give you, you know, the benefit of the doubt that you will be able to do what you're saying you're, you're gonna do it. And you can start by faking until you make it, okay? You don't need to have the full MVP blown up completely done, okay? Tell the story. And then, of course, you know, accelerators and places where you can network with people, okay? You have to get out of the building you know, mix up with people, okay? And if you go in, in places like Texters, or if, you, if you're in Italy, you come to Polia, okay? It's all this community. You meet people, you share ideas, and then you bring people on board, okay? You cannot do this if, if you stay in your, in your lab. Okay? And I, I forgot exactly to, that, that was the point I was going to make, thank you. That's where we took people on board from, from for instance, from sales. Right? And uh, the, where do you find this talent in places like Polycom? And, and money, believe me, if there is a good project, money is not a problem, even in Europe. We have early stage investors, you can imagine, even in Italy, okay? <laughs> and uh, in fact, we have companies and we will have a, you know, a, a, a speech in a few minutes from Leonardo where you know one of the investors and casually the same investor who invested many many years ago in Neurada has also invested in another startup. So things I'm not gonna say that are easier, okay, but uh, it's doable. It's doable. And the reason for for us to organize this session is to show you that it's doable. There's a question over there. Okay. And then over there. Yes, uh, as soon as you have to start acquiring new customers, there's this hazard that you are going to focus too much on one single customer and his demands and needs. So if you're just developing this customer once and wants it more and more and more, you're developing, 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 and you're completely losing overview what other customers in market might want. So how did you overcome this hazard? I think, you know, if I were you, I would satisfy that customer uh, as much as you can. But at a certain point, you can also have the customer pay for the development as long as you keep uh, the, the rights for your enhanced product, right? And then, you know, you have to go to, to customer number two and kind of, you know, start to, to average out what the requests are. Uh, so you have to kind of play both at the same time, you know. The, but the idea of, uh, I remember speaking with a, a successful CEO of a company that you know, made, made a, a, great, uh, a great outcome. He, he basically had his engineer camp outside of the factory until his solution worked. Uh, make, fake it until you make it. He had a person there in case the system will do that. And once they solved completely that problem, you know, at a certain point you always cut some stuff. But when you solve completely the problem, then you have something that you can probably replicate to another customer. The other thing you have to be careful about is that revenues are not the proxy of success in the early stages. Because you can make revenues by selling professional services and consultancy, doing something specific for one customer, and you might think, oh, I'm making some revenues with my product. No, you're not selling the product in that case. You're just 
providing you know, some consultancy. So if you want to develop a product, of course you have to work with your early stage customers, you know, but don't give them too much because as you correctly said, the moment you get, give them the finger, they will take all your development capabilities. So that, that's when the talk to customer is really useful because you, have, you talk to 10 customers where you do that one job and so you understand that is this very custom or is uh, it is applicable. Yeah. Over there? Yeah. Uh, so I'm curious, um, how did you manage to, um, like you talked about that you worked with DARPA and Boston University and then you had your own uh, startup and how did you manage to um, get Boston University convinced yeah. that uh, your patent is your own and you invented this in your free time and not during your PhD? Because I don't know how it's in Boston University, but for my employer, right. uh, if they can prove that some of my inventions, I had an idea in the coffee break and <laughs> in the office of them, yeah. uh, it's automatically right. uh, their invention and not yes. mine. I, I watched the first episode of Star Wars when the Obi-Wan Kenobi tells, these are not your droid. <laughs> I mean, seriously, right? almost, but uh, the, basically I convinced Boston University that in reality this was a tangential problem. I got my PhD at the supervisor and I did a bunch of other work. It's not that you know, I, wasn't, I was hanging out. So this is my thesis. This is something that, uh, and Boston University released that, so I have that letter framed, uh, in, in, you know, uh, and they say, yeah, this is yours. So we got a release, and a few others uh, patents that we did jointly with them, but they think, you know, they, they are both owned by us and Boston University, but they're kind of minor. Uh, but you know, I got a release from from the university. Boston University is famous also for, for having told, uh, I think it was Edison, that the light bulb was stupid. Uh, and uh, so you might find the university that if your idea is so crazy, they might say, oh, who cares? Um, just play stupid. We have time for one last question, and then we will have to move to the next speaker. Very short personal question. I mean, making a startup is really demanding. Having a family is really demanding. Oh God! Is the secret to combining the both at the long term? To come to places like Taormina <laughs> <laughs> for a few days. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard. Very, very hard. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's my secret. <laughs> anyhow, it would be hard. Anyhow, if we even open, you know, a pizzeria. <laughs> it's going to be hard because you have to work you know, seven days a week, you close late at night, and if you want to have a family, it's hard. Okay. But uh, if you have a passion, if you really believe in what you're doing, we'll find the energy. And the most important thing is that you will not do it alone. If you try to do it alone, you will fail. Okay. Why, how, and what? Mm -hmm. you know, they were three, and that's, you know, you have always to be with other people because the hard times especially in the early days, but even later, are more than the good times. So you need a shoulder where you can cry on. Okay. Very true. Thank you, guys. Grazie much. Thank you. Perfect. 39.58. Okay, do we have Alfio?